Hello, my name is Ray Hughes and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project that is orchestrated out of Washington, D.C. and the National Archives. And the local uh, administrator of the Veterans History Project is Brian Powers, who is taking care of the camera work today. And today is the 16th of May, 2017, and we have the honor and privilege of interviewing a Vietnam veteran, Lieutenant Philip J. Tolliver. And it's a, it's a pleasure to meet you, sir, and is it all right to just call you Phil? You better do it. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you so much. Um, uh, Phil, if you would, uh, where were you born in the date of your birth? Well, July the 10th, 1937, and I was born over in Cincinnati, but I grew up all my life in Erlanger, Kentucky. I see. Where at in Cincinnati were you living, do you recall? Oh, I've never lived in Cincinnati. Well, I just oh, went over there, was born there, and came back. Oh, okay. And where did you live at in northern Kentucky then? Erlanger, Kentucky. And your address? 124 Graves Avenue, and I still live there. Oh, in Erlanger, Kentucky. Yes. yes. Uh, and what were your parents' names? Um, Philip was my dad, and then Shirley was my mother. And your mother's maiden name? Denny. Denny. And what did your father do for a living, Phil? He was a funeral director. Uh huh. And uh, located where? Uh, right in Erlanger, Kentucky. In Erlanger. Now, was your mother a stay-at-home mother, or did she uh, have outside employment? She was a stay-at-home mother after she stopped being a school teacher at Erlanger Lloyd High School, and she helped Dad also at the funeral home. I see. And did you have uh, siblings, brothers yes. and sisters? Yes. My uh, sister is Betsy Mann, made, uh, married to David Mann. David was, he, he didn't do very well in politics. He's a lawyer. He didn't do very well because he went to Harvard <laughs> and uh, Center College, where I went to school, uh, beat Harvard for the national championship in 1921, six to nothing. It's the greatest upset in the history of college football. So he married my sister and took her over to Yankee land. <laughs> And all he, he's only been mayor twice of Cincinnati and uh, United States uh, congressman once, and now he's the vice mayor. Yes, yes, well known in Cincinnati and yes. this, this area. What grade schools did you go to? Went to Locust uh, Street Elementary and um, then Beechwood. Beechwood High School? Beechwood, uh -huh. Beechwood Elementary, uh, okay. fourth, fifth, and sixth grade and then back to Erlanger Lloyd. I see. And uh, you say you went to college. Where did you go to college? Went to Center College, C-E-N-T-R-E, -E, which is, of course, the finest college in, the, in America. And where is that located at? That's in Danville, Kentucky. I see. Um, where, where is that located? Uh, Danville. I, and what year did you graduate? 1959. And what did you do as a youngster growing up? Did you have any jobs, odd jobs, or things like that? Well, I had lots of jobs. When I was in the second grade, I started um, uh, delivering mail. And I always had some kind of work uh, after that. And I s still remember my dad got me a job for a concrete asphalt company and um, did that. Uh, off and on in the summers. Then I delivered mail uh, for the United States uh, government, Postal mm -hmm. Service, uh, every uh, winter. So I was always doing something. <laughs> um, what did you major in at Center College? Did a um, English and um, economics. I see. Now, uh, had you met your wife by this time, your future to be wife by this time? Well, no, but she's passed. She passed a year ago, uh, my former wife. I see. And um, uh, so. And what was her name? Uh, uh, Diana. Diana. And her maiden name? Uh, Diana um, 
I forget. I see. Per, uh, Perriman. Perriman. Okay. Uh, and when did you get married? Oh gosh, that was uh, 30 odd years ago. Uh -huh. Well, how did you get, uh, I forgot to mention that Phil was a, a local well-known and renowned uh, attorney at law. Um, Thank you. How did you, well, you are, especially uh, here in northern Kentucky in the Cincinnati area. Uh, how did you get interested in the law? Well, as I look back, um, I believe it had something to do with what they call divine intervention. Uh, I didn't understand much about that kind of thing until I went on the Emmaus Walk which was a three-day spiritual retreat, and um, I got hit by what those Christians call the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I've been at peace for the last, uh, since 2002. But I can still remember, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And my last semester at Center College, I was out in the hallway, and I just was talking to myself, and I said, how can I do something that can help other people? Because that's what my dad did. And zap, something happened and it said, be an attorney. I immediately applied and went through law school. Where did you go to law school at? University of Kentucky Law School. I see. And. Uh, and how long the course was that? How many years was that? Three years. Three years? Mm -hmm. And when did you graduate there? Well, I got out of um, uh, UK Law School, 1962. And that's when I then applied and volunteered for the United States Navy. What made you want to go into the Navy as opposed to the Army or Air Force or? Well, it's my family has an interesting military career. My father, who is, of course, my hero, volunteered stupidly at age 28 because he didn't have to volunteer to join the United States Army and became uh, the, one of the top sergeants because he was so old at 28, fought in uh, France, Battle of Verdun, and... Um, this is World War I we're talking about. World War I. Yes. And he, I think, brainwashed me. And he always talked about the military and he was a Mason and he always said, you take care of the men first, you eat last. And he took his men into town on a R&R &R after I think one of the ba big battles and, and um, said to the um, guy at the desk at the hotel, my men need a place to stay. And, and he said, sir, do you not have room for your men? And my father saw the Masonic emblem on his ring. Mm -hmm. My dad pulled out his Masonic patch and put it down and said, my men need to stay here. And the Mason said, sir, we will find room for your men. Outstanding, isn't that something? He brainwashed me. Yeah. And then uh, my uncle went to Center College, played football, and was the, ran the, the, the longest run back in the history of Center College for decades. And then he went, after one year at Center College, then went to Annapolis. And Gray was captain of the football team at Annapolis and then was 30 years in the Navy and of course uh, all through World War and, and he was still in the Navy when, uh, when I got out of uh, OCS, Officer Canada School. So uh, my uncle was in the Marine Corps, and another uncle stupidly volunteered and lied to get into World War II 
He was 16, and he told him he was 18. He lied to get in. So a whole long family history of uh, military, and um, so I've been brainwashed. I see. <laughs> uh, well, then when did you actually join the, the United States Navy? I um, uh, joined in 62 uh, and um, then went to OCS, uh, Officer Candidate School, mm -hmm. and did, I think it was 18 months or there or so. Where was that school at? Uh, at Rhode Island. What, what, what town was that? I forget. <laughs> okay. Um, it's wherever OCS was. Yeah. Um, so that was an 18 month, uh, 18 week, 18 week, 18 weeks. Yeah. And after the OCS training and your commission as a, is that an ensign? No. Uh, when you're a lawyer and I was a Navy lawyer, then you went through another several weeks of training for the law program. And then you became a, a, a um, JG, Lieutenant JG. JG. So you were one one notch up. Okay. But of course you missed asking me an important question. And? Well, after the first nine weeks, um, we were able to go for a weekend. And um, then you come back and did the rest nine, nine weeks. And we were at a bar and Lots of uh, uh, naval people around going through OCS, and I still remember having a few drinks of uh, of uh, whiskey, Kentucky whiskey, and there was a long table, and there were some ladies sitting around, and there were several hundred or. A lot of people there, all from OCS, and um, I had three or four of my guys with me. And there were the two tables were like like this, and the guy on the other side saw me and looked at me and started screaming nasty things and jumped in and grabbed the two tables and went boom like that and the glass went everywhere and he had been a big football star lineman for an Ivy League school and he was drunk I guess and he came straight at me well, I was a football star for Center College. Um, for some reason, they called me Birdman. I was 170, 175 pounds. I played tackle. And sometimes I even got to play as much as five minutes <laughs> if we were winning. And um, because they called me Birdman, I had kind of um, a little um, post-traumatic stress over that. So ever since then, I've been puffed up. And as you know, since we go to the Y together, you can see now what I've been able to puff up, see? <laughs> they also call me bird legs, but I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> so um, all my life, I played football. So he came right at me. He probably weighed 230 or 40, something like that. And just as he almost hit me to just destroy me, I did what we always do, tackle him, hit him, drop down like this. He hit me and came up right here. And I could have gone backwards or forwards. I went forward, smashed him down, glass everywhere. I looked at him and my mates that were around me said, Phil, get out of here. <laughs> and I jumped up and ran as hard as I could, turned the corner and went a, 
just a little while and dove in the back seat of my car and they rushed past me. They're going to kill me. He had a whole bunch of guys there. And so my guys came and I had this cut right here and you can still see the scar. Probably not on the camera, but it's there. Mm -hmm. And we went to the hospital and they kind of patched it up a little bit and next day see if you got in a fight um, at any time like that they'd kick you out of the OCS, OCS Officer sure. Canada School so we didn't know what happened the rumor was all over uh, the OCS candidates about this big fight we didn't know what happened <laughs> so I did make it out of uh, out of OCS and then went through the naval legal training and then one of the most interesting things that ever happened to me was sitting on a plane going to Subic Bay in the Philippines where we had the world's second largest naval base and I was in full uniform and right next to me just by coincidence and don't you just love a good coincidence? Yes. <laughs> it was Brad Butler. Well, Brad Butler was the head of all sales of Procter & Gamble for all over the world. And he had decided that day to check to see how the regular seating was as opposed to special seating. So he was sitting there. And I was sitting right next to him. He'd been in World War to Navy, then stupidly volunteered to go to Korea. I mean, he could have made something out of himself had he just not been so stupid to volunteer to go back to Korea. But he did make, oh, he was president and CEO of Procter and & Gamble. And he adopted me. And I hit Philippines and for some reason the head of uh, sales for all over the Philippines, uh, Silabaya, and his wife, they took care of me for two years. Now Silabaya, he was the world's tallest Filipino, I think, and uh, he had been captured in the big battle. Um, and then escaped and went to the mountains and, and fought the Japanese. And uh, he was fantastic. And so uh, because of Brad Butler, uh, I got special treatment all over the world. If I went to Hong Kong, he would call the head of the sales in Hong Kong and they'd take care of me. Wow. So. Uh, I was real lucky there, and I still remember arriving in the Philippines and on the bus from uh, the Air Force Base going to the city of Alongapo. Now Alongapo is a city, about 100,000 people, right next to the Subic Bay Naval Station. and. What happened was, as I uh, was driving there, I started seeing some things I'd never seen before. I thought I'd always been a bad boy. Um, but after a couple of years in the Philippines, uh, I, I must have been a sissy before that. But um, I still remember little kids with a little shirt on and no pants, just taking a pee right there. Mm -hmm. And you could see them as you went, went by. And um, then I went to Subic Bay and was the naval, you know, Navy lawyer there. And then a couple of days a week I was a uh, shore patrol officer, which is military police. And it was, it was kind of boring sometimes mm -hmm. when CETO, Southeast Treaty Organization, for example, wasn't there. And, but sometimes there'd be 30, 40 
thousand sailors and marines on one street at one time, hundred bars on each side. We weren't allowed to go beyond McSaiside Boulevard. And then there were about 60,000 beautiful little women helping the men. And as you can imagine, sometimes there was a little bit of... Brotherization. Oh, gosh. Sometimes people would fight. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, after having played football for Center College as a football star, You'd have to be crazy to play at 170, 175 pounds at a tackle. So I loved it. I almost got killed a bunch of times. And um, I remember um, loving it so much that sometimes I would go out in, uh, in cities and ride with uh, the uh, whoever was driving the bosun mate or uh, whoever it was was driving a paddy wagon. And this one time we went out and back in my day you didn't go to school with black people. Um, and you didn't go to high school, you didn't go to college, didn't go to law school. So I'd there weren't any black people. And this is uh, Smitty. Uh, I called him Smitty. He was first class petty officer. So he was driving a paddy wagon and we knew each other. He let me go with him just so I could, I loved it so much. And so we're driving down the McSaiside Boulevard. And since you were in the military, you know a little something about six cents and something happened and I said stop the paddy wagon Smitty I jumped out as it was still going and he stopped it like that and I went right around in front of him and jumped into the bar and there were about a hundred sailors trying to kill each other young little women around sitting and they were smashing each other. And I total civvies jumped in there and pushed people and and uh, screamed and hollered and they, they didn't know what it was. They, I, thought, I could have been CIA for whatever they knew or uh, you know Office of Naval Intelligence or whatever. Uh, they didn't know. And they, everybody stopped, they froze. And then this first class Petty officer. He was fairly short, really old. He was probably uh, in his 30s. And uh, I was 25. Right. And he says, Who the hell do you think you are? And you're not. I said, Put him in a paddy wagon, Smitty. Put him in a paddy wagon. And that's when I knew this black guy, Smitty. If 10,000 Indians had come over the hill, he would have stuck with me. He would have risked his life right there with me. From then on, I've always had a special relationship with some black people. And uh, Smitty grabbed him and then, oh, put him in the paddy wagon. So that's just a, you know, a little example of how crazy it was. Another time, you ever heard of Aussies? Sure. From Australia. Well, I'd never met an Aussie in my life. Mm -hmm. So this is one of those nights where I think it, at 11 or 12, they, you know, you had to be, everybody had to be back on the boats. Or it, so uh, I was walking in to this bar and this guy walked out and bam, fell right right on the ground. He was an Aussie. I never met an Aussie before, or Australian sailor before, or anybody from Australia. And for whatever reason, I decided to 
take him back to his ship. So I picked him up, threw him over my shoulder, put him in the paddy wagon, and then went right through the checkpoint. You cross, uh, here's Alongapo, there's Alongapo River, and here's the naval base. And we drove him. I saw what he had, and I somehow figured out that he was on a submarine. Took him there, put him over my shoulder, and there was a gangplank over there. And I still remember carrying him across over there. And the officer of the day there, he was so thankful because this guy had, had gone uh, probably 30, 40 hours straight fixing something that happened on the uh, submarine and made it work to get there. And he was so appreciative, and he said, "Well, could you come? Could could you come and and be with us uh, tomorrow night? We'll have dinner here on the on the submarine." Well, I'd never been on a submarine before, so I said, "Sure, yes, sir," because I think he was a couple of grades higher than me, and so got there, and they pulled out the whiskey. And I said, what? What are you guys doing? Hey, you can't drink on a ship. <laughs> he said, we're not Yankees. You Yankees don't drink on ships, but we Aussies do. <laughs> and so they drank. And uh, so then there was a bunch of Aussies. And, and then after that, we went to the enlisted man's quarters, or the, uh, the uh, officer's quarters, where they had a you know, band and a bar and everything. And they had all these Aussies there, and I still remember them singing, Tie me kangaroo, tie me kangaroo down, <laughs> whatever it is. Oh, yeah. They were singing and drinking, and I've been a friend of the Aussies ever since. It was, it was crazy. So uh, there were some things that happened. Uh, one of the things that happened uh, was, yes, being a shore patrol officer was uh, was fun, and uh, it was crazy. But being an officer of the day on the base was boring because you know nothing was happening. And um, I did that you know once once a week or something like that. And I got this um, call at about. Um, Six, and I can't remember who it was, but he said, uh, "Sir, I was the officer of the day, and I was uh, had been in like five or six months." And he said, "Sir, um, a Marine BLT is going to be on the base tonight." Now, BLT for you people who don't know anything about the Navy was a battalion landing team. 1,300 Marines, they floated around, and if there was real trouble, boom, they would go in and take care of it. So he said, uh, this Marine uh, BLT was so bad that they had gotten in trouble every single place they'd gone all over the Southeast Asia. And they would not allow them to go into town. <laughs> the only thing they would allow them to do was to go to the officers or the enlisted man's quarters um, in combat boots and uniform and, you know, drink and have music and that kind of thing. So I went over to the enlisted man's quarters and, and uh, got the military uh, police sergeant, and he was old too because he was probably in his early 30s. Right. And I said, Sergeant, uh, I understand there's trouble, um, and that you're not allowed to go into town, and uh, I'm officer of the day, and if there's anything I can do to help, uh, let me know. He said, Sir, we don't need your help, sir. 
we can handle our own situation, sir. Do you understand me, sir? I said, y yes, yes, sir, I do. Um, okay, thank you. And I went back. And one of the oldest people in the whole world was there that night. He was uh, um, um, E8. And the day I arrived in the Philippines, he was there and I said, uh, um, sir, he was chief petty officer, I said, sir, I don't have the faintest idea what I'm doing and if you could help me, I would really appreciate it. Um, tell me what, you know, give me some advice and he said, sir, you're not like a lot of these young officers who come in here and think they know everything. He said, you know how we handle them? I said, no, no, I don't. He said, if they're steering a ship and it starts to go aground, we let them go aground. He said, but you, we'll take care of you. We'll help you steer that ship. I said, thank you, sir. And he hadn't he had met some gray hair in there. He probably was in his, <laughs> I think he'd been in for 25, 27 years. He had some gray hair in him. And he's maybe 40s. So um, about 11 o'clock I got the call. And it was a race riot. Back in the early 60s there were race riots all over the country. And it was pretty severe. And what had happened, black Marines and white Marines were trying to kill each other. Mm -hmm. They played um, the Star Spangled Banner twice. Had a big band up on the stage, stopped them twice. Third time they kept on going. I got the call. <clears throat> and. Uh, my best friend was the head of Marine Barracks. He was a lieutenant of Marine Barracks, uh, not Marine Barracks, uh, uh, military police. He called out his men, and he may have had 20 of them, fix bayonets. That's how serious it was. I got there first and was in uniform white. I started grabbing people and throwing them around and you know, sit down, get out of here, you know, do all that stuff. As you know, that's totally improper. Violates all the rules. You're not allowed to touch an enlisted man if you're an officer. Took me about 45 minutes of screaming and hollering and pushing and shoving people around. It was a little, I was a little psychotic, of course. And got them all done. Had a little blood on me. Was, I was so pumped up, the adrenaline was going. And so, we got them all out. Started to walk out of the enlisted man's quarters and took about eight steps. And then the sixth sense again. And I turned and ran as hard as I could about 20 feet and dove on the backs of several black marines knocked them down i landed on my feet and there was a white marine right there they had combat boots on they were trying to kill him mm. stomp him to death with their boots and i spun around and started pushing people back that was standing there and one of them was six six probably two thirty forty and they I learned later they were black Muslims which were back in those days they were really trouble mm -hmm. and he said man 
you just push me and my daddy said nobody ever pushes me and he started to smash me in the face and I went into a total psychotic mood mode I got right up in his face and was screaming at him hit me hit me you MF I'll put you in the effing brig for the rest of your life screaming at him and it must have just totally unnerved him because his arm went straight down but just then one of his friends, you know what a billy club is? Mm -hmm. Well, one of his friends came with this close to hitting me. And the military police, the fixed men axe guys from the base, billy club that long, smashed him in the head, bam, like that. And his hand went right past my ear. It hadn't been for him probably had my head knocked off sure and then been stomped to death so that marine and he was a sergeant from Puerto Rico um, it scared them so bad that they took off and went you know got back on the boat to go to the ship so went back and I was all pumped up my old my you know chief petty officer I uh, was pretty pumped up and about, oh, about 45 minutes later, Lieutenant Colonel, a Major, and a Mustang, Captain. Mustang, back in my day, meant he'd been an enlisted man for like 20 years, and then he became an officer. They call them Mustangs. They arrived at the, uh, at the uh, officer station, and we were back in the the legal department, and he said, uh, I understand you were the officer of the day at the enlisted man's quarters. I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, what happened? I said, well, there were three, maybe 400 uh, Marines, uh, black and white, and, you know, they were really trying to kill each other. He said, that's not true. Your report will be that there were four or five people fighting. Do you understand me? And I said, well, no, sir. Uh, I was there and I told you what happened. He said, who's your superior officer? I said, well, um, Navy, Navy captain, uh, legal department. What's his phone number? He went in and called him. I can still, still hear him call me a liar saying that I had done, you know, it was four or five people. So they left. Between them, close to 12 and 6 o'clock, I spent those hours getting statements from up to 50, uh, 50 people. Many of them were gotten by my best friend who had a marine barracks and um, then out of the uh, you know the military he, military police he was there were like probably 20 military police from the base there and then the I think they had maybe 16 military police from the battalion landing team uh, 12 out of the 16 or in the hospital. That's how bad the, the fight was. And um, somehow we got statements from all of those people, all those men, and we had 50 statements, and all of them talked about how nasty it was and how many people there were. And a lot of the statements said that uh, this um, Mustang uh, captain who was there also stood silent and did nothing. Uh, of course, that's what he wasn't allowed to do, what I did. So I uh, got the statements. I was all pumped up. About 6 o'clock, here came the lieutenant colonel, the uh, major and the captain. And remember, I'd been there six six months. Right. So 
I said, I understand you've been taking statements from my men. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, I needed to do that. And he said, where are those statements? I said, well, I've got them back on the desk. I had a stack of 50 statements on the desk. He went over and took them. Said, um, we'll investigate this. And left. Well, fortunately for me, the bird colonel of the base had had a, half his legs shot up, shot off in the Korean War. Uh, he had adopted me. And um, my first call was to him. I said, Colonel, I hate to call daddy, but there's a problem here. And I about three cents. He said, fine. You tell him Donald L. Hubbard, Bird Colonel Donald L. Hubbard orders him to return to the officer station. Yes, sir. I'll be down. Called my Navy captain, the head of the whole base, told him, he said, go get him. I'll be down. So I got there just as they were getting on the, the little boat to go out to their BLT. I said, sir, Colonel Donald L. Hubbard, Bird Colonel, United States Marine Corps commanding officer of the Marine Corps base here has ordered you to return to the officer station, sir. So uh, they came back, the three of them. There was the officer station. Right here was the Navy captain, head of all the base. Here was my bird colonel, head of all the Marines on the base. I was here, and the three of them were here. The lieutenant colonel, the major, and the captain. And it was about that wide, the uh, officer station. And for some reason, within about less than two minutes, the lieutenant colonel and myself went over to, to, to grab each other. It got that heated. And I still remember my captain, who kind of adopted me too. And, Stand down! And both of us, you, you know, yes sir, sat back. And um, my Navy captain said, I understand you have uh, statements. And he said, yes, sir, we have these statements and uh, we will, uh, the colonel said, we'll, we'll send you a, a copy of these statements. And I still remember my captain's hand going out like that and taking the statements and said, I'll take the statements and the admiral will send you a copy. And then they left. About an hour later, I got the call to meet with the admiral. I'd never met an admiral before. You know, it was like meeting God. Went there, the admiral was sitting at his desk. It's about 7 o'clock or 7.30. My colonel's here. My captain's here, and after a while, the colonel said, Sir, I am so embarrassed at the way my Marines acted. Uh, they've had trouble all over Southeast Asia, and uh, they weren't allowed to go into town. That's how bad they were. And this thing tonight was a, a riot. And Officer Tolliver, he violated all the rules. He pushed men, uh, grabbed them, and you're not allowed to touch an enlisted man if you're an officer. And I don't know whether to give him a reprimand or accommodation. 
and I'm going to give him accommodation. And the next day I got the the, Is that the award. No, I had... Oh. Yeah. Uh, this right here? Right here. And this is a... This is not the original, but this is uh, what he gave me. And it uh, says here... Um, Just one second, Phil. Yeah. Let me put this back on it. There we are. Okay. It said... Uh, Honorary Marine Officer <laughs> of the Day, Marine Barracks, Subic Bay, um, Philippines. And uh, so after that, I became a lieutenant uh, a few months after that. And my bird colonel um, put the patch on me. And my Navy captain did the same thing. And then got a letter of accommodation and it made the uh, made the news. Don't you hold, you hold that a second and yeah. I'll put that on. Yeah. So um, it just talked about what it is and it said uh, I got this award and I said that uh, according to information uh, Mr. Tolliver, 25 years old, led a riot squad that quelled a 300 man disturbance on the base and uh, so they they gave me this and uh, uh, that's I'm, I'm proud of it. Absolutely. So uh, uh, and you're promoted to lieutenant at that time also? Uh, then after that, oh, a few months after that, then uh, my captain and colonel each put, put one on, so that made me a lieutenant. So that was, uh, that was <coughs> one of the biggest... What's, what's uh, the lieutenant equivalent to in the Army? Is that, um, is that two bars? Well, you go ensign, lieutenant JG, and then uh, lieutenant, lieutenant commander, commander, captain, admiral. So you're actually uh, the equivalent of a, a captain in the Marine Corps. Right, as right. As a lieutenant. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But I got, because I was a Navy lawyer, you got to, you move quickly. Uh, more quickly at, at this start. You start out as a JG, not an ensign. Okay. So, so um, then I had some... Well, that was quite a historical event, actually. You kind of brushed over it, but that's uh, a real trying situation you were involved there. Yeah. If it hadn't been for that that Marine... Um, from Puerto Rico. Military police from Puerto Rico. I'd have, I'd have been a dead man. Yeah, absolutely. I think. Well, after this, did you have any, were there any ill feelings towards you uh, with some of these guys around uh, Subic Bay? Because actually they tried to thwart your reports and... Uh, no, this, uh, see, this was a BLT. They rarely came, and um, within six months after uh, this happened, the lieutenant colonel, the head of the BLT, got kicked out of the Marine Corps. He'd had such a bad record, and uh, so. Uh, but uh, I, USS Coral Sea, uh, I got sent to. Hong Kong for some some reason and flew over to Hong Kong Ever after this yeah, right? yeah. and yeah. chronologically yeah yeah after this when that was this R&R &R in Hong Kong or what you know I think it was some I was supposed to do something but I can't remember what it was uh, it's only been since 
1963. So, uh, but I got over there, and um, uh, on the way over, I uh, met a beautiful little Filipino woman, and we visited that night. And um, two or three days later, um, I ate some fish, got amoebic dysentery, which is horrible, and um, also picked up some kind of a little disease, and then was put on the USS Coral Sea to go back to the Philippines. And um, fortunately for me, I'd been shore patrol officer, military police, one night a few months before this, where this Navy doctor who was on the USS Coral Sea had visited a, a young lady at a little house and uh, right off the um, Long Apo, uh, uh, McSaisai Boulevard, and he'd um, had a little relationship with her, and while that was happening, somebody opened a little side in the wall. They had built a little side and reached out and grabbed and stole his great big uh, camera, which was worth a lot. I was shore patrol officer. He came to me. I had a close relationship with the Filipino police. We raided the place, found it, gave it back, no record. So here I was with a little disease and uh, sick as could be, had a temperature of well over 100. And uh, for some reason, the doctor took care of me, and there's no record of it. And then I still remember after, I think it was several days, on the USS Coral Sea aircraft carrier. And I got pictures of it and everything. And um, flying off off of an aircraft carrier and then ri arriving at the naval station at Subic Bay because you had a Subic Bay naval station and then the whole Subic Bay, there's a little bit different. And I arrived there. It was, it was uh, quite an experience. So sometimes what goes around comes around. And um, then uh, I remember another flight. This flight was uh, to, you ever heard of Vietnam? Mm -hmm. Oh, you yeah. have, okay. <laughs> so uh, it was in 1964, I was uh, assigned to defend a, a sailor. And all he did was uh, he worked 20 hours a day they worked on um, aircraft, and he was on the hardest worker in the world. He was a first class um, petty officer or something, something like that. He was, he'd been around for a long time. And at a bar, somehow he shot a, a soldier. And I don't think it killed him. I think it went right here. The bullet went went around the wall a couple of times and hit it here and whoops, went right out. There's a little thing right here, you know, your bone. The clavicle. Clavicle, yeah. And so they charged him in the, whatever the highest court is called, <laughs> um, in the military. And I remember flying over with the, with the prosecutor. He's a lieutenant colonel. A, a, a lieutenant uh, commander, and uh, he was a little bit arrogant. So there was no way we could win the case. And so what I said was, uh, sir, um, rather than go through a you know um, a several day trial and take everybody's time, do you think you could we could reach an agreement? where let them give him a bad conduct discharge and um, 
you know, six months, that's the most you could get if we had made that agreement instead of a whole bunch of years in, in uh, the brig in prison and a bad conduct discharge. That'll save us a week of trial. He agreed because he didn't want to have to go through a waste of a week. So I spent almost a week at the hearing. They call it a sentencing hearing. And for some reason, everybody loved my uh, enlisted man. And I could still remember day after day after day bringing, you know, other sailors, officers, wives, little children, and even his commanding officer in a wheelchair because he had had something wrong or I'm in a, in a wheelchair, well it was on a stretcher to testify. And I never had anybody testify on a stretcher before. And so I explained to the court martial, I said, please, uh, we need him. He's taken care of our planes and um, he really didn't mean to do it and please uh, don't give him a bad de uh, conduct discharge. Let's keep him in. But, and, and it's not going to help the Navy if we give him uh, six months in the brig. You know what a brig is? Mm -hmm. Prison. And uh, so I said, please give him 60 days hard labor without confinement. And so they did what I asked. Now I'm so dumb that I didn't know any of the law. I still don't know any law. It could have given him a death penalty. But hard labor without confinement, 30 days was all they could give under the law. So <laughs> he, he got 30 days of doing what he was doing anyway. Right. <laughs> and so uh, I know you were in the Army, but I mean, it's, you know, it's not like he shot a soldier, a sailor, say. He just shot a soldier. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, that was... Uh, um, Did the prosecutor have anything to say? Oh yeah, he wanted six months and bad conduct discharge and he shot us, you know. He was screaming and hollering and the court martial took care of it. <laughs> so uh, uh, he got 30 days of doing what he was doing anyway. Yep. For shooting a, that was a little too much for shooting a soldier <laughs> uh, like Ray. <laughs> and uh, and then I had a few cases. Um, one of them was uh, Strawberry Carlton. He was uh, E E two, maybe. Um, he was at this bar, and he was sitting there at the bar and. And um, on those higher <clears throat> chairs, and <clears throat> guy at the end of the bar. In this was uh, on McSaisai Boulevard, right across the Alangapo River, and uh, in the town of Alangapo, you weren't allowed to go anywhere other than right down that street. Hundred bars, as I said, on each side, and in the end of the bar. One of his buddies wanted to borrow his knife. I said, sure, he took the knife out, zoom it down the bar. The guy was doing his nails. So, um, guy finished, shot it back. And then, for some reason, the knife went into his next sitting next door in his, in his heart. Two minutes later, he was dead. Wow. 
how do you get out of that? So I came up with an, a thought. No proof, but I had a thought. And that was that when he shot the knife back down, it was still open. And he picked it up and started to put it in his pocket. And as he was getting up, this guy right here pushed him. And he went, oh, like that. And um, the problem was, there was no witness, and my guy didn't remember it. So I explained to the court martial that what happened was, if you've ever been rabbit hunting with a shotgun, well, I was one of the worst shooters in the world. Sometimes I'd shoot five or six times at a, at a rabbit. And I still remember coming home, getting ready to take a shower, and I looked at my shoulder area right here. It's all bruised. It was all bruised. I had no memory whatsoever of any boom, boom, boom like that. And that's what happened to Strawberry Carlton. He got pushed. But he's not lying. He could lie and make it up. He just doesn't remember. I don't remember either. And so he got acquitted. Fortunately, the reason he got acquitted in part was because the guy sitting right next to him, I had him on a witness stand, and he was the world's worst witness. I mean, he, he just was a bad witness, and so got acquitted. So after that, then there was, a, it's not a big deal, but there was a, a little um, situation where the Marines go out and train. They went out in the, uh, wherever uh, it was, uh, miles from the, the naval base. And, uh, uh, one of them grabbed the other's rifle and the uh, corporal was up on the, the where you great big truck that you had seats for everybody that took you back and forth to training and he was up high and he wanted his rifle, and uh, uh, Private First Class Azell Davis, my client, was right here with it, like that. And he was up here, and then the shot went off, and it hit the Marine right here and went out his back. That night he died. And uh, they charged him with murder. My client, Zell Davis. So, I was trying to think maybe somebody pushed him, like they did Strawberry Carlton. But there wasn't anybody around. And I was trying to think what happened here. And at three o'clock in the morning I woke up. I knew what happened. Lance Corporal Paul L. Harris. Sitting up there. Right there. He reached out and grabbed that rifle and pulled it forward. And it would boop. And as L. Davis's finger hit the trigger and shot him right here. I had one little problem in the case, and that is that um, my client didn't didn't know that that happened. And I told the story about shooting there, and then they brought the uh, 
Office of Naval Intelligence there, and I had him on the witness stand. There's the, the, the Navy jury there, and uh, I remember leaning up against the, the railing, and I had all these black Marines behind me supporting my, my man. There was a lieutenant commander who was a prosecutor. He was a, kind of a famous prosecutor. He'd done some in Texas. And he's tough as nails. And so I still remember, I also nailed intelligence. I said, sir, um, what were the results? Results of what? Oh, of the test. What test are you talking about? The test that you gave. He said, I didn't give any test. You didn't what? Objection. Yeah, yes, yes, your honor. Uh, but uh, we need to know about the test. He didn't give a test? What test are you talking about? I said the test, the fingerprint test. When he reached out there and grabbed the, 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 the rifle and pulled it forward and caused it to sh kill him. You didn't, you mean you didn't take a fingerprint test? No. So I made my closing argument and I said, if only Paul L. Harris could come down from heaven above, he would tell you all what happened, that it was really his fault that did it. Of course, we had no proof. And I still remember this lieutenant commander. He was tough as nails. He grabbed that rifle. And he stood up there in front of that court-martial. And the table was at least as long as this one is. Probably, uh, what, 12 feet? That's where he was, and I had one over on my side. And he started talking about Marine Corps training. And he didn't open his mouth. And he talked like this, and he said, and, on and, on and, on and he went on and on and on, and then it got to where it was almost screaming, and then he flipped that, and he said, and, and he shot him, and he flipped it, and I still remember the rifle going up here, and it hit the edge of the table, and went boom, 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 boom and it stayed right at the end, it didn't fall off. And at that moment, I thought I was gonna be <laughs> serving time in the brig. <laughs> That's how scared I was. Because he said, "E, Mr. Tolliver must have communication with the heavenly spirits up above, because he talked about if only he could come down here and tell him. <laughs> oh, got an acquittal. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I still, I still uh, think it's uh, crazy. So, um, had uh, had some experiences. Wow. I'll and, say. Uh, uh, and then after, after I was there for nine or so months, and um, uh, they decided I'd be a, they made me a prosecutor. So then I prosecuted a bunch of cases, and um, um, after that, then uh, was uh, um, sent to Alameda Air Force Base. You ever heard of Alameda? Yeah, uh, Naval uh, Base. Uh, by San Francisco. So. Yeah, right by San Francisco, and um, I almost had a nervous breakdown. I loved the Philippines so much that uh, if I'd have stayed another year, I'd never come back. And uh, I just, uh, uh, my experience in, the, in Vietnam, Saigon was, uh, was kind of wild too. I met some, met a young lady there and uh, we 
we visited, and uh, she spoke French and and um, uh, Vietnamese and English all at once. Her father was the head guy for some department in in Viet, you know Vietnam, mm -hmm. and uh, she was certainly beautiful and. She could scream out in three different languages. <laughs> so uh, there was. Uh, this was before things really heated up. I think it was in '64, and uh, but uh, but the experience in in Vietnam was was fantastic too. Um, but then um, ended up going to, as I said, Alameda and. It was so boring. Uh, I didn't. There wasn't much work to do, and and uh, so there was this case I had, though. Uh, I think he was a first first class petty officer, and we he'd done something domestic violence or something, and uh, we. It kind of worked out a deal um, in the city of, I guess it was uh, San Francisco, and um, pled guilty and everything was okay. I think he was a, he also maybe a first class petty officer or, um, you know, he was E6, E7, something like that. Mm -hmm. And so, nice guy. And uh, we went, uh, there's a, uh, a board that you go to on base and we put our case on and said he was sorry and he pled guilty and he'd never do something like this again and they said okay. It was appealed to Washington, which they do that morning, you know, a couple of months later, a few months later, got the order that he was dismissed from the United States Navy. And he'd been in for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what to do. The only way we could do it was to go to federal court. Well, I had never been in federal court. And it was San Francisco, I'm not a licensed lawyer there, and I don't know if I could have done it anyway, being a Navy lawyer. So somehow I knew the, the Navy doctor, I can't remember his name, but I think he, his brother was somebody I'd gone to law school with. I didn't know him very well, but I went over and talked to him. It was going to take 15 minutes because you had, you had to have a medic, medical before you got discharged. And um, for some reason, from about uh, 8.30 till about 3.30 in the afternoon, this doctor spent examining him. And during that time, I found a uh, lawyer in San Francisco and that lawyer, he was quick. He, he filed a, a complaint in the federal court. And there was a restraining order by the judge. Um, it didn't get in until that afternoon, the restraining order signed by a federal judge. And it would then have to be served on the admiral at the base. So. Um, he was, this, this enlisted man was released and they were going to kick him out, but somehow he disappeared. And people, I don't know why people would say this, but people said he was under my desk for two or three hours while the uh, military police were searching for him all over the base. I don't, I don't understand that. So. Um, then after the order came on, people say he jumped out the side window of, of my legal office there and ended up 
um, in the enlisted man's quarters uh, underneath a, uh, a bed, you know, bunk beds. And um, nobody could find him. So about, uh, about 6.30, somehow um, this, this lawyer from San Francisco with a restraining order, somehow he drove through the checkpoint with me in my car. And we went to the Admiral's house. He knocked on the door and served the Admiral. And about 15 minutes later, this enlisted man came out just like he came out of nowhere. And um, then they, they found him, but they couldn't kick him out then. And so it went through a procedure and he was never kicked out because the federal court wouldn't allow it. And I still remember the head of Navy JAG um, was visiting different places and one of his speeches was, and he didn't know who had been involved, the Navy lawyer had been involved, but he was lecturing about, you can go overboard, you can do too much for somebody. <laughs> 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 and I even met the guy, he didn't know it was me. <laughs> So, uh, there have been some, some interesting experiences. Anybody, anybody ever call you Clarence Darrow? No, no. They, I, uh, <laughs> well, maybe sometimes, but uh, wow, it was a, it was a wild ride, and and I loved it so much, um, and uh, I I know you wouldn't understand this because you were in the army, but. Um, in Southeast. I was, I, actually, I was worse than that. I was in the Air Force, but go ahead. So you're in the Air Force, so yeah. you wouldn't understand, but uh, all over the, uh, all those places, uh, Vietnam and, and uh, Thailand and, and the Philippines, and uh, there were beautiful young women there. And uh, as I told you, they, they, they helped the men. And I loved it. It was just, it was just wonderful. So uh, that's uh, just a little brief history of uh, my experience in the in the United States Navy. I tell you, it's um, kind of thrilling to listen to it. To be honest with you. Oh, thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, and I mean that sincerely. Uh, I'm glad you shared those with us. So, are you approaching a discharge date now, or about? <clears throat> well, I I stayed in the um, reserve for several years. Actually, we had a reserve unit here uh, on the Ohio River in Covington, mm -hmm. and um, I stayed there. I don't know into the seventies, and then I I don't know what you retire or whatever you do. When did you actually finish your active duty though? Uh, oh, I finished, uh, it was uh, 60, 62 to 66. So, um, in 66 you're still in San Francisco? Yeah, I think it may have been, it may have been maybe December of, uh, uh, of 65 that we got discharged and, and um, then I came back and started practice law and in Covington in early 66. Um, where did you go to work uh, first when you were practicing law? Ware, Bryson, Nolan, and West. It was a law firm, it was a wonderful law firm here in Covington. And uh, I got paid 15000 a year and uh, they said I could get um, a third of any business I brought in which I, of course, didn't bring in any business. <laughs> I mean, you know, first coming back. Right. Um, have, have you met your wife yet, the wife-to-be yet at this time, yeah. 1966? Well, I've been um, 
uh, my uh, fiance Mary and I have been together for eight years so um, uh, I'd been married before that for over 20 so and um, so that's what I'm doing now with Miss Mary now you what about children uh, so got uh, uh, four children um, my s their names if you would yeah Philip is uh, in law school now he's at um, going to go in his third year at UK law school then Morgan my daughter who uh, it's a terrible I hate to admit this but she went to U of L <laughs> you ever heard of University of Louisville <laughs> it's just a it's just a um, backwater school it's huh? just it's just terrible <laughs> and she only made a 3.77 there out of four and anthropology whatever that is and uh, my son who passed uh, he had cerebral palsy um, what was his name Phil this was Greg and he um, got his uh, ma uh, doctor's degree even though he had cerebral palsy he couldn't blind he couldn't see out of one eye and was blind the other one um, and I remember and it was probably in the 80s late 80s at a Kentucky Bar Association meeting where there were three lawyers there and all three of them were from UK and I hate communism and always hated communism and um, uh, I said, you know, it's just, just terrible. Uh, my son is, is going to University of Louisville. And they said, yeah, that's terrible, Phil. We, we feel so sorry for you. And then I said, hey, and there's only one thing worse. Uh, he could be a communist. And they said, no. Going to U of L is worse than being a communist. <laughs> so uh, he became a, a psychologist of, and passed away several years ago. Um, then um, I have another daughter, Laura, who's a social worker, and up in Toledo, she's wonderful. And then Gina, my other daughter, was the head of the dean of the Montessori program at Xavier University. And um, she's retired, and now she's working on international stuff. So those are my kids. So, and, uh, so uh, it's been a it's been a very interesting life. You can say that again. Yeah. Usually at this point, um, I have Brian uh, with a few questions. Brian. Uh, yeah, I got a, just a couple of questions. I was just curious if, with your dad, uh, how did he get into the funeral home business? His mother, his mother's brother was H.G. Uh, Blanton and he owned a funeral home. But back in those days, you, it was a horse and buggy and you had lamps that you had, you know, uh, candles on it and um, I think my father back in 1929 maybe took it over at, or even before that and then built the funeral home in Erlanger Kentucky in 1929 and um, was there until he was uh, in his 80s and he was born in 1889. So um, he passed away in his 70s. So then we we rent, my sister and I, we lease it to a, a funeral home. And uh, so we still have the funeral home. Did you ever think about becoming a funeral director ever in your life? Uh, no. Um, have you ever heard of the, the term Digger Odell? On the uh, radio. <laughs> that's right. It was back in the old days. And because I was uh, the son of a funeral director, they called me Digger Odell. And I think, 
that that just uh, made me, you know, just feel bad about it. So I think that's one of the reasons I decided not to go into the funeral business. I think he used to say on the radio, I've got a spot for you. Yes, <laughs> yes, Digger Odell. <laughs> um, so when you went over to the Philippines, the Vietnam was, was in its, you know, was kind of happening, but I was, what was the sense that you were getting when you were in the Philippines of, how was the Philippine War being, uh, how were you hearing about it in the Philippines at that point? That was pretty early when you were over there, but I was curious of how it was depicted, or how, how were people talking about what was going on in Vietnam? Well, it was a big topic uh, in the Philippines because, at Subic Bay, because people were being moved there, and it was slowly ramping up, and there were a lot of uh, things that were happening. Uh, I remember one one building, uh, maybe a hotel that uh, uh, military personnel were staying in was blown up. I can still remember that, and um, I still remember they uh, they got over to a ship, navy navy ship, and put a bomb there, and it blew up part of the side and so there were there were operations going on but nothing like it did when it ramped up and you were on the base right in the philippines were you, were you I, I lived there yes did you get did you travel much around in the philippines did you get, uh, i was wondering where did you what you might have seen and done and you're you going around or anything everywhere because um the Filipino head of uh, uh, Silabaya, he and his wife took me everywhere. So it just was, it was, it was wonderful. Uh, was there a, a favorite spot that you remember of the Philippines that you liked, or a city or a village or anything? Yes, Longapo, because <laughs> there were some beautiful little women there. And uh, speaking of, of that, uh, I still remember as a prosecutor. And we had finished the case at, at noon. And the judge, who was a bird colonel, Bubs Oliver, Colonel Oliver, he had rules. And he drank a quart of whiskey every day, <laughs> whether he needed it or not. So I dropped him off at the uh, officer's quarters where they had the bar and everything. And then I picked him up that night about 6 o'clock. And he, by that time, had most of his, you know, daily quota. And he was in uniform, I was in uniform, because we were going to the Phil M. Banquet. This was the uh, yearly banquet for lawyers who were Filipino lawyers and then lawyers on the base, Navy lawyers. Phil M. Banquet. And um, so I had gotten a little puppy, Duchess, from the uh, Navy commander was second co in command of the base, and uh, he'd given it to me. He had several of them, and he gave me this puppy. And you weren't allowed to have them in. You understand that you weren't allowed to have animals in in uh, uh, officers' quarters at that point. But somehow he spent every night with me, and uh, then I had a little area outside during the day, uh, a little fence around, so he was in the fence and he had a little place he could go inside and, you know, a little dog kennel. And um, so here's the Subic Bay, the water, and then officers' um, quarters are, uh, you know, where you drink and everything are here, and then you cross the street and then you that's where the officers stayed in this big building. So 
I picked up the colonel and I said, I want to show you my puppy. And so I got the puppy, put him right here. He was licking the colonel's face. And just then the commander walked by and saw his puppy. Came over. Oh, puppy, pet the puppy. Well, the puppy was so happy to see his daddy. He peed all over the colonel, bird kernels, right here. You, I can still see it. <clears throat> Didn't bother him a bit. And uh, <laughs> so then I put my doggy back in the kennel and we drove up to the McSaisai, or to get over to go to McSaisai Boulevard, 100 bars. And I don't know. Is this uh, whether I'm allowed to tell you what he said? Sure. Is that okay? Sure. We crossed the Longapo River, and it's wild. People selling monkey meat. You know, they kill monkeys and put it on a stick, and they're those little. They're not taxis. You get on the. You climb it on the back of them. And, you know, it, it's just wild. Sailors, Marines, whatever. And uh, so he walked across and he said, he used the P word. He said, P, bring on the P. And, you know, um, you know kind of, he, he's a bird colonel. Oh, and he was a, a I think he was All-American, a football player for I don't know, Oregon or something like that. Played in the Rose Bowl. He's a tough guy, and he he kind of adopted me too. And uh, then I never forget what he said. And I've taught my kids and my friends and family what to say. To see the Air Force, they're so politically correct at all times they wouldn't understand it. But he, what he screamed out, when in doubt, whip it out. <laughs> and, and I'll never forget it. <laughs> he, it was, uh, I'm going to remember that from now on when yeah, I see you. <laughs> that's right. And, and if I ask you, when in doubt, you better you say, say, whip it whip out. It out. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I, there were, a lot of other experiences that it's probably better not to talk about. <laughs> well, you, you mentioned that you, you visited in Vietnam, and I was wondering what were your impressions of, of in that time period you were there. What was what was the, what was it like in Vietnam? What, what do you remember your impressions of it? I guess? Well, there was a lot of anxiety about um, where we were heading, and people. Uh, you know, soldiers, sailors, and Marines were just starting to up, 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 and there were, you know, places that were blown up, and they were fighting, but nothing like it was. Um, but the uh, people in Saigon, they, they liked us and uh, treated us, you know, treated us well, and so, um, this was, I guess, 64 when I had that trial, and so we, we went on from there, and it just escalated up to where uh, it, it was total war, and uh, I didn't go back. I, I think I was, I, I may have been there in 65 to, I think I was in, in Vietnam a couple of times, whatever my records say, you had to have records. But um, it was um, it, it, it even in uh, Saigon. Then it was still wild. People were getting killed, and you know, military people were getting killed. But nothing like it was as it got got really bad. I was curious. Uh, those guys that you you were able to, to get off get off their murder charges. Did, did you ever keep in touch with them? Did they ever get you a nice gift or anything? No, but I, on Strawberry Carlton's parents, I, I got a nice letter 
from uh, from them, and then the f really the first time I ever felt the spiritual part of a trial was in the um, the Black Marine because the that was Davis. Yeah, Zell Davis was uh, when he when when the gun went off and and there were probably 25, 30 black marines in there and they were 100% supportive and I could feel the spiritual effect in the room and um, that was the first time I ever really understood that, that sometimes it was a spiritual effect as well. Uh, I got two more questions. Um, my uh, next question is, so why didn't you stay in the military? Why did you uh, finally, uh, the, why did you, I know obviously you went into reserves, but uh, why didn't you decide to make a career uh, being a Navy lawyer? Was there a decision or a reason uh, that you can? I, I'm not really sure. I think part of it was had I had I stayed in the Philippines or then gone to Vietnam, I probably would have stayed in. But when I went to Alameda, it was uh, it was very uh, boring in terms of the legal work. Now, the one thing that we had that I'll uh, always remember was um, the football team. And so it was flag football where you, you know, stop by, by grabbing a, uh, and so because I was so old, you know, um, I think I was, what, 28, I got to be the, uh, the captain of the team, uh, the, the coach of the team. And I recruited a bunch of wild men uh, from different parts. And so we had, um, I don't know, seven or eight um, teams. One of them was a Marine Corps team. And then I was, there were only two officers on our team. And um, one of them was a halfback who was uh, a pilot. And so we played and we, we really did well. And I, we didn't have a center, so I became the center. I've never been the center before on a football team, and uh, but did it, and uh, I still remember we were playing these this uh, whatever whatever it was, and just one one guy he probably weighed two thirty or so, he was smashing people in the head on the other side, and I kept going to the ref and said, ref, you know he's hit, he's hit my men and. And uh, nothing happened. So right next to me, my, my uh, guard, black guy, I said, take him out. He said, yes, sir. So I got ready to center the ball like that. And all of a sudden, he came right over me. And he was going to smash my head off. Now, back in my day, we didn't have face masks when we played in high school. And our coach said, if you want to break a man's nose, you go a forearm shiver right here. And this is the forearm shiver. That's what they call it back in those days. And you smash, you aim for this, but you smash and you go for the nose. So, it scared me to death that he was right over there. He was just like this. He's going to knock my head off. And I shoot that ball back and and I went back like this, like I was going to run away. And went all the way down and BAM! Hit him in the face with everything. Forearm shiver. Knocked him down. Blood squishing everywhere. 
<laughs> and uh, so uh, we won the game, and <laughs> and uh, after the game, he came over and said, "Sir, you really messed me up." He said, uh, "If you hadn't have done that, I'd have taken your head off." And what he had, he had some kind of a plastic thing around his elbow where he was snatching people. He had taken my head off. So, oh, wow. and so we uh, ended up getting. Uh, we won second place, and everybody got a, you know, one of those plaques. And uh, so it was. There were some wild times there too, but nothing, <laughs> nothing like uh, uh, Vietnam and uh, and uh, and the Philippines. Well, I just got one last question. Uh, since you were did both of this, but what would you say the the key differences are between like a military trial versus like the trials that you do now, like a civilian trial? How how is it done differently? Would you say? Well. The reason nobody almost ever won a case in the military is because the the admiral, at least in the, in the navy, the admiral would appoint these. I call them jurors, but they're the the, jur the, the jury, and um, uh, there would be I think some enlisted men, and but the admiral appointed them. It wasn't a, a selection like you would have it here, so. Uh, uh, very few cases were ever won, and um, but you got to do an opening statement. You got to, you know, cross-examine witnesses. You got to uh, do a closing argument. So in many ways, it's it's very similar. Did you do you feel anything with your military training has helped you with your your career? Well, I mean, I couldn't have. Uh, been luckier than to try all those cases when I didn't have the faintest idea that I was doing just right out of law school. I never tried a case, and, uh, so that you know that was the, the whole thing. I after after gosh um, several dozens of trials as a prosecutor and a defense attorney, uh, I had a lot of experience, and then. After that, I uh, was, was lucky because I was here a year and um, I asked John Elfers, the county attorney, if I could be his, uh, I think he got elected for office and I said, well, could I be your assistant because I've had this experience. And he said, no, my campaign manager is uh, my assistant. Uh, county attorney, and then his assistant died about five or six months later, and he called me up, said, "Okay, it's yours." And after that, then, and there was only back in those days, there was only one assistant, and I did every prosecution uh, all over the county, all this, you know, everything, and mm -hmm. then all the police. Uh, would come, you know, and and uh, uh, the state police and um, you know all the local police. So that's when I started representing all the police, and I've been representing them for 54 years, uh, almost all in the you know northern Kentucky. So it was just lucky that I that I had that job and uh, for like five years, and then um, Wendell Ford ran for governor. You don't know if you ever heard of Wendell Ford, but sure. uh, he was a lieutenant governor and he ran for, for governor and everybody was for him. And then Bird Combs, the former governor, stepped down from the, from the United States Court of Appeals to run again and everybody rushed over to him, and there were five lawyers in the state that supported Wendell Ford. I was one of the five. And um, so his staff and I were very close, uh, brothers and sisters, all, you know, pretty much same age. And so after he got elected, his chief of staff said, well, put Phil on the personnel board. 
which handled 32,000 state workers. If they had a problem, they would appeal to the personnel board. And I still remember Governor Ford, who had been in the Army, and um, we were there out in um, Ludlow doing a, uh, a big event. They were trying to reestablish this bay they had there, and I had several hundred people there, and the press were there, and I remember saying, all right, Governor, um, what we're going to do is we're going to move up here and um, in, in your car, and we'll put the, we'll put your state trooper in this car, and you you get in the lead car, and he put his finger in my face. He said, "Who's governor anyway? Me or you? My trooper rides with me." And sometimes I could upset the governor a little, and then and um, for some reason the staff did things I asked. They always took care of me, and I had my dog, and I'd be there two or three times a month. Frankfurt, as I became chairman of the personnel board, and I'd throw my dog in the, the governor's office. Said, "Okay, I'll, I'll pick him up uh, about 5:30." They took care of my dog for me, and uh, they did. I mean, they helped me. Everything I ever asked for. I don't want God to ever find out, but uh, Bill Smedigy, uh was a, became a judge. He was Republican, and there were no Republicans. And uh, he said, uh, "Phil, do you think you can get my my uh, daughter a summer job?" And it was already April, and they'd already filled the gaps up by February. They had interns like, and so I called chief of staff and. Uh, somehow they hired her, and all of the Democrats in Kenton County were furious. What are they doing? What's he doing to hire? I don't know how it happened, because they they took care of me, mm -hmm. and uh, so then the last day of the governor's off, uh, his uh, he got elected to the United States Senate. He became second in command of the Senate as years went by and he he was making this speech to oh I guess they were probably 12, 13 year old kids. It was a kind of a his lobby where his secretaries were and, and then his office was right there, private office and then down the there was an aisle here with his his uh, staff on each side. And I've spent a lot of time with his staff for some reason. And so I was there in the kind of the doorway where his staff's officers were, and he finished his speech. He turned and looked at, saw me, and he walked over. And he said, There's only one good thing about me leaving the governor's office because I don't want to. And that's not having to put up with you telling my staff what to do. <laughs> then he left. No go. He walked off. That was his last day. <laughs> uh, but we, you know, we, we all, I always was for him and he, he, about 90% uh, of the time he did what I suggested, but he never liked suggestions. <laughs> well, I don't have any more questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, at this point, I want to thank you for this interview, Phil. Lieutenant Philip Tolliver, United States Navy. And thank I you. also want to take time to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. And the same to you. Thank, Thank you. you for your service to our country.